Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming. And before I forget, I'm going to do my thank yous now. Uh, so first of all, to Paula and all the people here at the library for letting me do this here. It's, it's really nice to have this room and this resource available to us in this community. So I hope that you're using it as much as possible. Um, just to prove that we really need it. Uh, also, I want to thank the Southwest Minnesota Arts Council. They, uh, they awarded me a, 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 an individual artist grant uh, that helped support my trip over to Spain for the research that I was doing, and uh, which is one of the reasons that I'm able to do this. So I want to make sure I thank them as well. So the Festival of Moors and Christians a celebration of heritage. Um, the Festival of Moors and Christians in Spain uh, really is derived out of the, it's a celebration of the reconquest of Spain from the Moors in the Middle Ages. Uh, the Moors who were essentially, for those who don't know what that is, uh, essentially they were Muslims that had spread across northern Africa and eventually came back, came up across the Strait of Gibraltar and started occupying the Iberian Peninsula, which now makes up Portugal and Spain. And that incursion, so to speak, uh, or movement into that area began around in the 700 AD range. Um, and they were there for quite a while, starting in around 1100 or so, the, the citizens of the peninsula started trying to force the Moors back out. And it took about four or 500 years for that to happen. Um, they weren't finally completely removed from, well, they really never were completely removed, but overall the, the governmental and um, kind of legal influence of the, the Moors were finally removed around in the 1500s. And so the Festival of Moors and Christians originated as a celebration of the retaking of Spain. And in particular for the communities that have this festival, the retaking of their communities from the Moors because it happened at different times, starting in the north and working its way south. So the earliest documented festival that we know of happened during the 16th century in the 1500s. Um, exactly how long they've been going on, it's really impossible to tell. But we do, there is documentation that they took place in the 1500s. And uh, the picture that you see here is an old picture from Cosentina taken in 1886. And it just kind of shows well, I like the picture, it's kind of neat. It shows a little bit of the history. It is an old photograph. And you know, the people here in front are members of what's called the Comparsa. Uh, the festival itself is really driven by these Comparsas. Comparsas or Filas, they're essentially fraternal groups that have developed in these towns. It's sort of like, you know, if your town has an Elks Lodge or, you know, some, if you watch the Flintstones, the Royal Order of Waterbrook Buffalo, it, you know, it's in some ways it's a little bit like that. Um, and initially they were, it was all men. Uh, it's really only been within the last 15 to 20 years that they have opened up to women as well. Um, they're also very much fam familial types of groups. Many of these comparsas are made up of people whose families have been involved in these comparsas for generations. Um, in fact, there, you know, some of the pictures that you see today, some of those people may have great, 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 great grandparents who participated in the exact same comparsa that they did. And you'll see in some of the pictures that it really is kind of a family sort of thing. Now, these comparsas, they spend all year, they fundraise, they advertise, they, you know, they make costumes, they purchase things, they do all sorts of things to really make this festival happen in these communities. And they do get some support from the city, many of them do anyway, but a lot of it they have to raise on their own and they spend a lot of money on this festival. And I think you'll see why when you start seeing some of the other pictures that I'm going to show you. Uh, but these comparses are 
aligned with one of two sides. They're either Christian comparses or they're Moorish comparses. Now, everyone that's in these comparses, regardless of which, essentially they're all Catholic because 90% of the populace in Spain is Catholic. Um, but they align themselves for this festival with one of those two sides. And you'll see in a lot of these pictures that a lot of this festival is about the conflict as well as the relationships between these two sides that developed. And the reason why I call this a celebration of heritage is that although the festival began as a celebration of the expulsion of the Moors from Spain, it is really over the last hundred years has turned more into a celebration of the shared culture and heritage that developed because of that extended period of time where those two different cultures were interacting and in close proximity to one another. And really that occupation, other than the initial battles where they came in and the battles forcing the Moors out, that occupation was relatively peaceful. Uh, they worked together, they lived together, they respected each other's differences, but there, were de there are definitely things about Spanish culture in their architecture, in their music, uh, in their artwork, that you can recognize that there's a clear connection where, where there's still hints of that Moorish influence uh, that you can find in their culture. Now, the festival locations there's supposed to be a map in the background there, but it's a little bit washed out here. Um, can, we, can I turn off the lights just a little bit, see if I can make that stand out just a little bit more? The button? This button? Nope, that really didn't help at all. Okay, so I will turn it back on. <laughs> Okay, I thought, there it is. Okay, well, anyway, the, the Festival of Moors and Christians originated in Spain, but has actually spread all over the world. Um, there are festivals each year held in countries such as Italy, France, Venezuela, Colombia, Mexico. Uh, I even found out, I didn't know this until I was over there, in one of the museums, looking at photos they had up on the wall, there was a festival of Moors and Christians held in Santa Fe, New Mexico, back in the 1990s. Now, it hasn't been held since, um, and that's okay, but it just kind of shows, you know, the, the scope of this, how much it has spread. Now, of course, the great majority of these festivals are held in Spain, and for people who aren't familiar with the makeup of Spain, Spain is made up of 17 autonomous communities. Um, these communities are actually based around a set, what were essentially kingdoms at one time. Um, the country of Spain itself is actually a relatively new phenomenon. Um, for a long time, they were these individual little kingdoms, so to speak, or, or regions. And when Spain was unified, they kept a lot of these regions as in much the same way that we have states here in, in the US that have a certain amount of autonomy that make their own decisions to a certain extent and then there are things that the, the, the country's government takes care of as well. Um, and the majority of these festivals take place in the community of Valencia. Uh, Valencia is an uh, a, a area actually just a little bit smaller than New Jersey that is on the far east coast of Spain along the Mediterranean. And the uh, community of Valencia, or the, the region of Valencia, is made up of three provinces. And uh, of those three provinces, the southernmost province is Alicant. And that is the region where the greatest majority of all the festivals take place in that very small area, less than a quarter of the size of New Jersey. So a very small place, probably over half of the festivals of Moors and Christians that take place in the, in the world each year, take place just in that small province. And so uh, some of these re names up here are communities, and communities that are well known for their festival of Moors and Christians. The one on the top, Alcoy, is the one that I had a chance to attend back in April when I was in Spain. And 
most of what you're going to see and hear about will be related to Alcoy because that's the one I've seen. But each one of these communities has a festival that has been going on for a very long time. Alcoy, Cosentina, and Ontenient are the three communities that most likely have the oldest festival of all. Uh, it's impossible to tell which one truly is the oldest. Each one of those communities or claims that theirs is, of course. Um, but undoubtedly, Alcoy's is the largest. Now, Alcoy is a community not even the size of Marshall. It's not a big place. But yet, their festival is, is the biggest each year. It is the most elaborate. It's the most you know, flamboyant. Um, and it's actually recognized by UNESCO as a site of touristic insta uh, interest. It's one of, you know, UNESCO is the same places that, you know, say, you know, you got to go see the Sphinx, you got to go see the Colosseum, you've got to go see Big Ben. Um, and they're saying that if you're going to go to some kind of event, this is one of the ones that you want to go to in this tiny town in a mountainous region of Alicante. So it's, it's a really special experience. So the festival in, in Alicante, or in Alcoy, um, there are events for this festival held throughout the year. Now, the part that tourists really get to know about is the main body of the festival, which consists of basically three and a half days. And I'll talk about each of those a little bit. But there are plenty of pre-festival events that happen starting about a month before the festival itself. And even before that, there are isolated events that take place throughout the year. And actually, the last full day that I was in Spain, I was in Cosentina talking with the composer, and he said, hey, you want to go get something to eat? And I said, sure, why not? And he ended up taking me to the headquarters of one of these comparses, and they were hosting a big luncheon for all of their members, as well as members of three other comparses in Cosentina. And this was one of their big events where they're introducing some of the important people related to the festival and, you know, really just keeping the festival alive year long. And their festival isn't until the end of August, and yet they're having this event in April. So it, in many of these communities, especially the ones with the bigger festivals, this festival is really celebrated year long in, in small ways, and then the big part of the festival. Now, the pre-festival events in Alcoy start four days, well, they start about three or four weeks beforehand, but the biggest ones happen about four days before the main body of the festival begins. Um, and those include the Gloria, or sorry, the uh, Procession del Traslado, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment, the Solomne Truduo, which actually takes three days. Uh, and then you get into the main festival activities, the Fiesta del Paso Doble, which is also known as the Day of the Musicians, um, uh, the Dia de las Entradas, or the Day of the Entry, or the Parades, the Dia de San Jorge, which is a religious festival that celebrates St. George, who's the patron saint of the city. And then it ends with the Dia del Alardo, which is the Day of the Battles. And so we'll talk about each one of those a little bit, just so you get some, and really what I want you to get out of this is kind of an overview of what the festival is and what it means to this, these people. And then we'll get into some of the other, some of the music a little bit as well. So the Gloria Infantile takes place about three weeks prior to the start of the festival. It takes place on a Sunday. And essentially what they do, they select one child representative around age 10 or 11 from each one of the comparses. And they dress up in full costume, and you'll see more of these costumes in a bit, and they parade through the streets of the town. They're, they're preceded by people on horseback playing drums. Got to feel sorry for those horses. Uh, but and, you know, there are other horse, you know, people on horseback in there. There are also bands. Two of the local community bands or, uh, participate in this as well, following the, the children as they move through. Um, up here you can see these are all representatives from the Moorish comparses. And then this is the child representative of the Christian captain 
uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, here's a picture of one of the community bands. Actually, this is the oldest community band in the community of Alcoy. The group is called La Primitiva. And this group actually began in 1830, and one of the reasons that the band came to be was to support this festival. Now, four days prior to the start of the festival is the Procession del Traslado. Now, I mentioned that St. George is the patron saint of the city. He's also the one celebrated during this festival. In fact, the people of Alcoy, uh, they, they give credit to St. George for interceding in the battle that allowed the Christians to drive the Moors out of the city of Alcoy. They believe that he showed up at the battle and really turned the tide because the Moors really over out, outmanned and outpowered the Christians who were trying to remove them, and yet they still succeeded. So they celebrate St. George as the person that really made that happen. And for the Procession del Traslado, what they do, they, within the town, they have a temple to St. George. And in the temple of St. George, there are several things housed, including several statues of St. George, as well as what they call the artifact of St. George. And for this particular occasion, they move one of these statues, which is the one up there in that corner. And I'm sorry it's blurry, but I, I had to take it from a bit of a distance, and then I blew it up and it turned blurry. But what they do, the people of the town come out, they get these candles, and they just, they line the streets of the town. And the, the bands each move through, and everyone processes through the streets. Um, all three of the community bands in Alcoy participate in this. They play, you know, various paso dobles or processional marches uh, for this. And people move through the town, and at the tail end, they have some special people. This person right here, this is a young boy about 11 or 12 years old, and he is, every year the town selects a young boy to be St. George, the child St. George. And you'll see him in other pictures later on. Uh, he's toward the end and he's carrying the flag of St. George. Um, also at the end will be the statue of St. George carried by representatives of the comparsas. And they process through the streets and they make their way back to the main square. Now off of the main square, they have a big castle built each year that becomes part of the festival. Behind that is the main church in town. And they take the statue into the church and that's the first you know, that's essentially what they do that night. It starts at about 7.30 and the whole thing lasts until about 9.30 or 10 before it's all done. Now, the next three nights are what's called the Solemne Triduo. And these uh, essentially are smaller parades. They start from different locations around town. There's kind of a Christian processional and there's a Moorish processional. Not all the comparses participate every night, usually maybe one or two. And essentially it's just about building anticipation for the main body of the festival and keeping things going. So you'll see here, this, this particular group is a bunch of female representatives of at least one of the comparsas. Um, again, this is a relatively new thing for this festival, um, but it's a nice thing to see. But you'll see people on horseback. Again, you'll see the bands accompanying them. The bands are very busy that time of year. They basically have something to do every day for about a week and a half uh, related to this festival. Okay, so the first official day of the festival is the Day of the Musicians, or the Fiesta del Paso Doble. It starts in the evening at about 5.30 p.m. and lasts until about 11. Um, everything over there lasts pretty late, really. Um, and on this day, what they do is they have almost every band that is going to participate in the festival comes and they parade through the town. They come from two different directions and they kind of alternate coming into the square. And of course they pay, play Paso Dobles as they're moving through the streets, hence Fiesta del Paso Doble. And they stop in the main square of the town 
and they finish playing. And when they're done, what they do is they move down toward the castle, and then they wait as the other bands come in. On this particular evening, there were more than 25 bands participating in this event. There are over 30 bands that end up performing as part of the festival. And that's just the bands. That doesn't include other musical groups that participate. Now, at the end of the evening, one of the things that I found to be the most special is all these bands stay after they get to the end of this little parade or procession, and they bring, every year, the town brings in a guest conductor. And the last thing they do is that guest conductor directs the massed group all playing the, the hymn of the festival, which is a piece that was written back in the early 1900s. Um, all the bands know it. It's unique to Alcoy. It is their hymn. No other town uses that, but many of the towns have their own hymns of the festival. But all these bands know it, and it also has words, and all the people in Alcoy know the words to this. And so the band starts playing, and, you know, I'm standing in the, I mean, I'm taking this picture. They, they sectioned off the square with police tape so that people weren't, you know, going in, mixing in with the bands and everything and making a mess of things. And so these are all the bands, and you're, I mean, there are thousands of people crammed into this square and the streets that shoot off of it. And the bands are playing, and all of a sudden you hear everybody start singing this hymn. I mean, it's a little bit like, you know, going someplace and hearing everyone here start singing, you know, the national anthem or God Bless America or something like that. It's, you know, it's, it's just, it's a really festive thing. And the people of the town really embrace this festival. And I think it's just one way of showing how much they do embrace it. Um, the evening ends with fireworks. Uh, you can see right here, this is the castle that I was talking about that they build. This tall spire is the steeple for, for the church where, where a lot of other things take place and where they move that statue. Now, the first full day of the festival is called the Dia de las Entradas. Now, this day is, has two parts to it. There is an, a Christian entrada, which is basically the entrance of all the Christian comparses. That takes place in the morning. It starts at about 10.30 and goes until about 2.30. So it's about a four-hour four ordeal. Um, and what happens is these comparses parade through the town. There's a very specific parade route that they follow. It's very ornate. Um, they, you'll see in the pictures, and you can see in this one, this is not one of my pictures, by the way, I stole this off the internet, um, but these are my pictures. Um, they have very elaborate, elaborate costumes that they wear um, of different types. Uh, they all have bands that support them. Many of them also bring in drum groups or dulcina groups. Um, a dulcina is, it's, it's essentially a primitive oboe type of instrument. So take, an, take the prettiest oboe that you've ever heard and make it sound kind of raunchy, and that's what it sounds like. I mean, it's a very raw kind of sound. Um, but they bring in these groups and, and they play music that is designed for this festival and to support their entrances. In particular, what we'll get to in a little bit, with the Christian comparses, when they come in, they're accompanied by bands playing Christian marches. And these are marches that are written specifically to go along with this festival and to bring these Christian comparses in. They have a somewhat unique sound uh, that you'll get to hear a little bit of in here in a little bit. Um, you'll see in the Entrada, you'll see people on horseback, uh, particularly in the, in the Christian uh, in Trada, you'll see a lot of people on horses. Uh, you get some different things later on. This picture right here is a picture of the Christian captain and his female cohort. I honestly don't know what they call her, sorry. Um, but every year, all the Christian comparses select a Christian captain. All the Moorish comparses pick a Christian or a Moorish captain. They also pick a general or what they call an Alferenz. Um, on each side as well. Well, this is the captain 
for the Christian side uh, this past year. Um, this picture, he's up on a big tall float about 12 feet off the ground, you know, up there waving at the crowd and so forth. And in front of this, he's got his guard who wear special costuming and they're on horseback and they have special weapons that they're carrying. Um, before that, you have bands, you've got dulcinas, you've got dance groups. Um, so a lot of things that happen as the captain goes through, and it's his group that goes through first. And then each of the comparses comes through, and then the Christian general comes through at the end, again, with more dancers and, and all of that. So one of the things that I also found interesting that I alluded to earlier is that these comparses in this festival are really a family affair. It's something that the entire family participates in. And so, like you see these young kids walking through and you'll notice that they're wearing the same costumes that their parents are wearing. And they get even smaller. I mean, there are actually, and you'll see, oh, well, there's, there it is right up there. You can see a float that they've built with child, infant child seats in it. And it's not like those kids are just wearing a onesie. No, they're wearing a costume. And you have to think about how much it costs to costume, you know, 100 plus people, including having costumes for kids as they gradually go, grow older and older and older. And so, you know, you, I saw kids that couldn't have been more than two or three weeks old being carried through this entrada. At the same time, I saw people in their 80s or 90s also participating in this. So it's something that, you know, that lasts your whole lifetime. Now, I'm going to show you just, this is a, a short video that I took. This is one of the comparses coming in, just to give you a sense of some of what you see during this festival. They're playing a Christian march in the background here. You'll also no notice they're not in a hurry, <laughs> which is one of the reasons why the Entrada takes four hours. Uh, it's the slowest parade I have ever seen in my life. Of course, if you spend a hundred grand or so on an event, you'd want it to last a while too, so. Now the people that are in that row walking down, they'll take turns kind of being the person out front. And with many of the comparses, the person out front has a special weapon that they'll be like spinning and, and doing all kinds of crazy things with just to kind of rev up the crowd. It is a very social event, so it's not unusual to see people talking <laughs> as you go, they go through, or smoking, or carrying a beer. Um, it's all good. <laughs> Now these costumes right here are the actual traditional costumes from this comparsa. The others are extras that they've purchased to make their part of the entrada more elaborate. And this is one of those floats with a lot of kids on it. And you see a guy here, you know, how old is that kid he's carrying? Eight months, nine months. So, after they complete the Christian Entrada, then they take a break for about three hours and everybody goes and eats and they go home and they relax and they drink and they smoke and all that good stuff. Um, 
And then they come back in the evening, starting at about 5.30, they start the Moorish Entrada. And the Moorish Entrada lasts from about 5.30 until approximately 11.30 at night. It is a very long ordeal, but it's also the most grand part. I mean, the Christian stuff is really interesting and you know, great costumes and all, but the Moorish part is even more elaborate. And traditionally and historically, the Moorish comparses have really been the ones who have driven the evolution of the festival. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while. Uh, on this uh, slide, you can see this was actually the very first float that came through. You know, they've got like a giant alphorn sounding thing blowing. I mean, that's not it. There's a speaker in there. But um, they were followed by dance groups of dancers. Actually, they had three different groups of dancers going through, each doing their own dance with their own musical accompaniment behind them, whether that was drums or dulcinas or a band. Um, this gentleman up here is the Moorish captain from this past year. And you can see how ornate his costuming is. Um, and he's riding in, again, on a very large float. It was about, oh, 18, 20 feet long and about 10 feet high with shields on the side that, that could move out and back in. Um, a, a really elaborate thing. The, the center picture on the top are some of his guard wearing somewhat similar, you know, related costuming, but a little different. And there were three different groups of guard as well, each with their own unique costuming. Here are some other pictures uh, up there in the top corner. Those are, uh, this float had somebody who looked, he was wearing a long black robe, kind of looked like a sorcerer or something like that. And he did this, you know, this motion and all of a sudden this, this woman sort of dressed up like a snake rises up out of this rock and starts dancing like a snake. And then other people, you know, come up, they're dressed almost look like sand. Here you've got people representing plants and water and, and so forth. So again, you know, just doing lots. These guys up here are carrying a battering ram um, through the parade. It's a long time to have to carry that. Um, here you see a guy coming through on a camel. There were quite a few camels. Um, there weren't this year, but in years past, there have been elephants, people riding elephants through this entrada, particularly on the Moorish side. Um, they've had caged tigers. They've had, you know, all kinds. I mean, again, they spend big money to make this happen, to make it as elaborate as possible. Um, here, I mean, that, that kid's got to be a month, two months old. You know, and still dressed in the costume of his comparsa or her, her comparsa. Um, here's one of the comparsas, just show you some of their costuming. You can see they've got kind of a unique shield like weapon that they're carrying. Um, it's a little harder to see. This guy's carrying a kind of a unique looking blade that he would be spinning, you know, and doing all kinds of stuff with. Again, revving up the crowd. Uh, here, here are some pictures from toward the end of the parade when the Alferens comes in. And that, this is the Moorish general for this year. Okay, different costuming, looks a little bit more like a general. Um, this is, you know, a picture of another group. This was part of his guard. Uh, the guy up there on the camel, who is also the subject of the poster for this. Um, I was really happy with that picture, how that one turned out. Um, you know, riding through, and there were six of these guys. Again, all with their own costuming. Um, there were several bands that accompanied. This is a picture of actually a dance group. There were about oh, 30, 40 girls dressed up in these black bird outfits. And so they had dance movements that they would do on this float as well as things they would do out in the street, alternating with other dramatic uh, sort of action that would take place. Uh, during that part of the parade. Um, the ones that I caught most of the pictures, uh, or most in this picture, are the ones who are essentially strapped to this float on this, you know, tree. Um, so they stand up there for six hours for, <laughs> for the parade, flapping their arms. Um, but again, you know, if, if you're going to spend that much money, you want it to last. So here is a uh, video from the Moorish Entrada. 
uh, you will notice the people in, in Spain are very, very friendly. Um, it, I didn't realize this when I started shooting this video, but the band that you're going to hear in the background um, had borrowed musicians from some other area bands. And it just so happened that they borrowed some musicians that I had met a couple weeks earlier visiting in Ontinent. And so at a certain point, you'll start seeing people looking at the camera and waving and talking and so forth. They're talking to me because they recognized me. They had just met me two weeks before we shared a drink in a bar and I watched one of their rehearsals and they could still, you know, they remember, saw me in the after, and they had already, I was at the end of the parade and they had enough wherewithal to, you know, to recognize me and say hi and all that. So. Now you'll hear this more later on. But if you listen to the music that's being played and compare it with what was played earlier, it is much, much slower, which is one of the reasons that this entrada takes so much longer than the Christian one. The, peop the guys in that front row were also wearing contacts that turned their irises white. It gets better. <laughs> yeah, just stop playing. Hey, how you doing? And you see that throughout the parade. I mean, I saw a guy, I was on the front row of like six rows of bleachers and he like climbed up to the top row to talk to somebody up there and he's moving through the parade. So, you know, it's, it's a little informal at times. <laughs> I'm going to skip that one. Okay, so the second full day of the festival is the day of St. George. And this day is in, dedicated entirely to the religious part of this celebration. Uh, it starts early in the morning um, at about 8 in the morning. Uh, the day before actually starts at 5.30. I was not there at 5.30 in the morning because I had been there till 2 and I had been there till one the night before and I had to drive 45 minutes away to where I was living at the time. So I was not back at 5, I was not here at 8 in the morning either, mind you. But um, you know, early in the morning, bands go out in the street sort of to wake up the town. So <laughs> there aren't too many towns where you can get away with that. So uh, anyway, so again, this day starts with another procession. It starts at the Temple of St. George and they process through the street. Here's that child representative St. George that I pointed out earlier in his full costuming with the uh, flag of St. George. Um, and they move the artifact through the streets of the city. Now, accompanying that procession is one representative of each one of the comparsas. Doesn't matter, Moorish or Christian, they're all participating. And the streets are lined with other members of the comparsa as well as people who come to see the festival. They process through the town following a very similar pattern that they did for the traslado, and they take this new statue into the church. Now, those of you who have seen paintings of St. George, St. George is, is well remembered for killing a dragon. In Spanish tradition, particularly in this region and in this town, they use a very similar kind of picture, except he's not killing a dragon, he's killing moors. And so uh, you can see there's a Moorish character there just underneath the horse. And it's an image of St. George slaying one of the Moors as they're driving them out of Alcoy. So um, once the statue arrives in the church, then they actually do a full mass um, with music, with an orchestra, with a choir, with communion, the whole shebang for a Christian mass. Um, 
and lots of people come, it's standing room only. In fact, if you don't get there long before this statue comes in, there's no chance that you're sitting down except on the floor. Um, it's packed, absolutely packed. And the mass that they play is written by, was written by a local composer named Amango, Amando Blanquer, who's also a very important Spanish composer, contemporary Spanish composer, who passed away actually not all that long ago. Uh, but he wrote that mass specifically for this festival, and they're the only ones who do it, to my knowledge anyway. So that's what happens in the early part of the day. And then through much of the afternoon, it's just kind of regular festivities. You'll see, you'll see comparsas walking through the streets with a band following them for seemingly no reason whatsoever, uh, whatsoever other than to just play a paso doble as these people walk through the street. And you'll walk past like an alleyway and there'll be a big tent set up and they, you know, a comparsa will be there having lunch and a band will be sitting there, you know, beer on their table, eating, and all of a sudden say, time to play, okay, and they'll play a Paso Doble, and then they'll eat some more. Um, I mean, these bands there that are involved, they bring these bands from communities, obviously there aren't 30 bands in Alcoy, so they bring bands from all over the region to come, and they actually pay these bands. It's actually an important uh, source of income for the community bands in this region to come and play for these festivals. Um, but it's really just fun to watch. You know, they're not organized events that you can really tell, um, but there's just activity going on all day long. And then in the evening, they have, oops, wrong button. In the evening, they have another procession. And for this procession, they take the, the image of St. George and the artifact out of the church, process through the streets, and take them back to the temple of St. George. And these are just a few pictures. One of the things that I thought was really special about this is uh, sort of illustrated in this top center picture. You see, this is a, one of the representatives of one of the Christian comparsas. And every, all, the, all the men, essentially, who are going through this as part of their comparsas, and the comparsas do participate with about 15 to 20 people going through for each comparsa in this procession. Um, but they're all carrying versions of an old black powder rifle called an arquebus. And each one of them has one person at the back who's carrying an arquebus with flowers stuffed into the muzzle of the gun, seemingly as a representation of peace. Um, and perhaps the peace that St. George brought when they drove the Moors away, but even the Moorish comparses, you find this as well. Um, and I, I thought that was very interesting. Up there is a picture of the artifact, um, artifact of St. George. This right here is, this is the Christian general from this past year. I did get a good picture of him during the Entrada, but I did on that particular day. And as they process through the streets, you know, there'll be at least one representative of each comparsa carrying the banner of their comparsa through the procession. The third day of the festival is the Dia del Alardo, and this is the day of the battle. Now, this is sort of the theatrical day. It starts early in the morning, and it, again, it's divided into two parts. The day starts with the Christians owning the castle. Okay? In fact, you can see that in this picture up here in the upper left-hand corner. And you'll see there's the Christian captains in the center, the Christian general to his left. To his right is the Christian ambassador. Um, and then other important people, the bishop is up there as well. And so, you know, they, they have the castle at this point. And what happens is there's a, a messenger from the Moorish group that will ride a horse down the hill. And when I say down the hill, I mean down the hill. This is a steep hill. Um, Alcoy's full of, full of them. Uh, but so comes down the hill on horseback, bringing a scroll with a message from the Moorish captain. And somebody up in the castle lowers that pole down with a hook at the end of it, and they put the, they hook the message on that. They bring it up. The captain, you know, they call, the, hey, come look. They sent a message, you know, it comes out and he reads it. And of course, they're looking at each other very dramatically like this is a bunch of bull. And eventually they tear it up and they throw it away. 
you know, just basically thumbing their nose at the Moors. And, well, the mas messenger takes off on his horse at full gallop up the hill, and about a half hour later, the Moorish ambassador with his own entourage comes down the hill on horseback and then proceeds about 20 minutes of dramatic stuff. They have these speeches that they've memorized. In this particular case, you know, the Moorish ambassador is essentially saying, what a beautiful town. Wouldn't it be terrible if we have to tear this, all this up in a battle? So why don't you just give us the castle and spare the town and all the people that live here? And of course, the Christians say, heck no, I'm not going to do that. Go away. Um, and then ensues the battle. Now, the battle itself is not really a battle. It's a commemoration of the battle. But what happens is they start from the castle, led on one side of the square by the Christian captain, and on the other side of the square led by the Christian, or the Christian uh, general. And each one of them, they have their own guard with them, and they're all carrying rifles. And they essentially, they hand a loaded rifle to the captain, who then fires it down at the ground. And it makes lots of noise. Um, and the captain never has to load his own rifle. It's always handed to him. And there are like six to eight guys all loading rifles. So there's always one at the ready. Um, and they start moving through the streets, followed by all, each of the comparses. And they essentially, they walk through the streets in two lines, which you'll see in a moment, firing these rifles at the ground. It is a very, very loud day. Um, and I did not have earplugs that morning. Um, and this festival is a holiday for the town, so everything is closed except for restaurants and bars. Um, so I actually had to leave town, go to the next town south to find an open pharmacy and buy a pair of earplugs so I didn't lose my hearing. Um, so I missed a lot of the morning part, but I, I was there to see all of the evening. Now in the evening, oh, I'm sorry, what I, I forgot to mention is that what happens as these comparses go out, they spread out, they kind of, you know, spread out into all the streets of the city, firing these rifles. And there's just a constant haze of black powder smoke through the t town. And at a certain point, they reach a point toward the outskirts of the town, and they are met by the Moorish comparses that do the same thing, but drive them back to the castle. And then there's a sword battle between the captains and the generals and the bishop and, you know, and all that. And the Moors take the castle. And that happens in the morning. Then there's another break. People go eat, drink, be merry. And then they come back, and the whole thing starts again, but this time in reverse, with the Moors starting in the castle, moving through the city, coming back, the Christians take it, and of course there's great rejoicing because most of them are Catholic. So, um, but here are some other pictures from this. Again, lots of smoke. Um, the, I kind of like this picture. That's another one of the main churches in the town, um, you know, just seeing it shrouded in all that rifle smoke. Um, here's kind of a panoramic view of the, uh, this is the Moorish general and the Christian general where they meet. And in this case, the Christian general is starting to drive the Moorish general back toward the uh, castle. And in another location in the town, the same thing is happening between the two captains as well. Um, at the end, I mentioned there's a sword battle that's up there in the center. Um, there's a point there where, you know, the two captains face off really close, very dramatically. And eventually, you know, they drive them into the castle. They go in through a door one at a time. So always starting like with the ambassadors go through first and then the bishops and then the generals and the captains go through last. Well, by the time the captain goes through, the first group that started going through the door comes out at the upper level and they continue the fight up there. And they eventually drive them to the far left-hand side of the castle where supposedly they slay the Moors and retake the castle. And so this is a picture of part of the celebration where they take the, the, the castle, they throw away the Moorish flag and they raise the flag of St. George. The evening ends with what's called the apparition of St. George. 
Um, again, a celebration of his intervention in this battle that took place in 1267 to retake the town from the Moors. Um, again, a, a figure of St. George is paraded through the town. Uh, eventually, everyone makes their way into the main square. Here's a picture, kind of a panoramic view of part of the square with lots of people in it. There were a lot more that showed up before it was over. And then they have lots of fireworks and they sing the hymn of St. George again. Um, the child version of St. George is on kind of a mechanical horse up at the top of the castle. And the, it just kind of, it moves across the castle and then it spins and moves back across and it, it does that. And they've got these little plastic arrows that, that he throws to the crowd. Um, yeah, watch your eyes. Uh, but you know, it's, it's just a lot of fun. And then they start shooting off fireworks in the background. It's, it's, it's a really fun, fun night. So, so that essentially is the festival. Now, of course, being a band director, I was most interested in the music side of this, uh, although seeing the festival got me more interested in all of it. In fact, the longer I was there, the more I got to know some of the intricacies of the festival and how everything ties together, which was one of the great things about actually being there. That was stuff I couldn't have learned just by reading about the festival or looking at videos on Google or YouTube. So. Uh, the music of the festival is provided primarily by bands, and it's been that way since around 1817. 1817 was the first time when one of the comparses, one of the Moorish comparses, uh, Fila Yana, uh, one of the oldest comparses of the festival, hired, they contracted the local military band to play for them. And the band played, you know, military marches and so forth as they did the entrada. Within 15 years, over half of the comparses were accompanied by bands. And that spread to all the festivals in the communities surrounding them as well. Um, but they also used dulcina groups. As I said, a dulcina is essentially a primitive oboe. I actually bought one. This is a dulcina right here. I'm not going to play it for you to spare your ears plus the reed's really dry, um, and it was kind of expensive, so I don't want to break it. Uh, but this is a dulcina. It has a very unique sound, um, very raw. Um, but there are also drum groups that move through as well. Um, as far as the types of music that are played, they play festive paso dobles, some of which are written for other occasions. But nowadays, in particular, a lot of the Paso Dobles that they play are ones that were written specifically for this festival. Um, they play Moorish marches, um, they play Christian marches, and then in the case of Alcoy, uh, on, for the religious parts of the festivals, like for the processions for the Day of St. George, they also play processional marches, some of which are written specifically for the festival, others are ones that are written for other religious festivals like Holy Week and, and other other events. Now, the history, just a short history of the music within the festival, like I said, in 1817 was the first documented appearance of a band uh, hired to uh, play for Fila Jana. Uh, in 1882 was the very first, the first documented piece of music written specifically for the festival. Again, up to this point, they were bands were basically playing the marches that they knew, whether they were military marches or festive paso dobles, just whatever they had that would work. Okay? In 1882, um, the band director for La Banda Pri uh, Primitiva in Alcoy, this gentleman right here, asked his son to write a march for them to play for this festival. And his son, Juan Canto Frances, wrote a piece called Maomet. Now, I put up here that it's the first documented composition because there are actually several other compositions that may have been written beforehand, but there's no specific documentation. They know that they're old and they're from around that time and possibly before, but like there's no annotation saying this was written this time for this, for this occasion. This is the first one like that. Uh, later, about, well, 15 years later, 
uh, the very first Moorish march, 25 years later. Anyway, whatever, my math is wrong. Uh, but the first Moorish march was written, and uh, that was written specifically, again, for Fila Jana. Uh, they commissioned this piece to be written to accompany them. And what they were doing is they were looking for music that would really sort of imply the spirit of their comparsa, bring out the exoticism of what they were doing as a Moorish comparsa. And so the music um, over time developed to this really exotic kind of sound. The first one isn't terribly exotic by our ears, but would have been at that point in time. Uh, much later, like more than 50 years later, finally one of the Christians comparsas said, you know what, the Moorish comparsas have had these Moorish marches for years. We want some marches that are ours too. And so Amando Blanquer, the same guy who wrote the Mass, wrote the very first Christian march. Now those took a while to take off because the, the style itself is a little more amorphous than the Moorish marches. Um, so. I want to play some short examples for you. Uh, we won't play all of it. Um, the Fest of Paso Doble, one of the most famous of these is a piece called Paquito el Chocolatero uh, by uh, Gustavo Pascual Falco. Uh, it, he is a composer who's from Cosentina. Um, in fact, in their Fester's Museum, they have a museum dedicated to the festival, as do Ontonient and Alcoy, by the way. They have the original score, handwritten score, for it, um, and a nice painting of him as well as other composers from Cosentina. Um, and as it says up here, this is played for a lot of the parades and processions that take place throughout the festival. And I'll just do this. Okay, I got it here. Not terribly fast, just a very comfortable kind of walking speed. So, just a little bit of, of that piece. Um, then, the Moorish marches. Um, the Moorish marches, in, in comparison to a lot of the other marches, is much, much slower. The average Moorish march moves at about 50 to 60 beats a minute, whereas Paso Dobles and Christian marches move for more around 90 beats a minute to 100 beats a minute. So it's a really dramatic difference. They also have very different sounds to them. Um, without going too heavily into the musical, theoretical side of it, they use scales and harmonies that create a very unique sound. They use what we call augmented intervals that are a little farther apart from each other than what we're used to in most of the music that we hear, and it gives it a really exotic kind of flair. Um, so, and they also tend to use a, a lot of percussion. Now, one thing that I mention up in that top bullet point is that there are actually two different types of Moorish marches. There are ones that are designed to be performed in parades and in the processionals and entradas, and then there are ones that are designed to be performed in concerts. Um, the ones that are in concert are far more elaborate and complicated. Um, they're ones that wouldn't necessarily work on the street because as a band walks down the street, 
you get sort of changing a changing perspective on the music and with this music it wouldn't with those pieces it wouldn't work very well um, but there are others that are written specifically to be used for these parades um, one of the most famous of these is called Chimo um, and it's written it's one of the parade type ones um, we were actually going to be playing this piece last night with the Marshall City Band uh, but got rained out so now we'll be doing this on July 11th by the way so I'll let you listen to a little bit and then you'd have to come to the concert on July 11th to hear the rest and This is the tempo. <laughs> Now, this march was written by a gentleman named Jose Maria Ferrero, who was the band director in Ontenient, another community with a very old, very big festival. Not as big as Alcoy's, but the next biggest uh, in the world. Um, he wrote this specifically for his festival, for his band to be able to play with this festival. And um, he, he is revered, absolutely revered in this town. He passed away in 1987. He was killed in, a, in an auto accident. Um, they have a park in town that is de named after him and dedicated to him. That's how beloved that he was. And he's also one of the most well-known uh, people in terms of Festival of Moors and Christians music. If you actually do any research into it, it's a name that comes up again and again and again. Um, and I mentioned that the comparsas and filas are, you know, often family groups. So their community bands tend to be the same. Um, and I was in Ontenient and listened to one of their rehearsals, which went from 1030 at night until 1230, by the way. Um, and I met his grandson. His grandson is playing clarinet in the same band that he used to direct. And his son was their band director for a long time as well. So it's, it, you know, very traditional, very much in the family. Now, with the Christian marches, I mentioned that this style is a little bit more amorphous. So the example that I'm going to play for you here is called Alleluia. It was the very first one written by Amando Blanquer in, in uh, Alcoy. And it actually sounds quite different than most of the Christian marches that we hear today. This one sounds much more like uh, church music. In fact, as you listen to it, you can almost hear like a grand organ playing this. Notice the tempo is quicker, uh, uses, you know, more tonalities and scales that we're used to.
and it goes on a bit longer. Um, Another important thing, difference between Christian marches and Moorish marches is that Christian marches tend to be very brass heavy, whereas when you listen to Moorish marches, you'll, see a lot, you'll hear a lot more open woodwind sections that are generally a little softer, um, whereas a lot in the Christian marches, there's a lot of brass writing and a lot of loud playing. Um, there's a little less dynamic contrast that goes with it. And their percussion parts tend to be less active. The Moorish parts tend to be far more complicated. Um, and again, a little more exotic sounding. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to play the next example here, but processional marches um, are drawn from a variety of rep repertoire written for other occasions, but there are some that are written specifically for this festival. Uh, I did, there's one example there, uh, but there are others. They're very slow, very solemn pieces that are designed to reflect the solemn nature of that religious celebration. Um, the festival itself, you know, for me and, and what I've learned as I've been researching this and talking with composers and band directors and, and so forth over there and attending the festival, it's a very unique kind of tradition of band music. And for me, that's one of the things that I find most interesting is that it really is a tradition of band music. Here in the United States, we have band music, but our band tradition really started by playing orchestral transcriptions and choir transcriptions and so forth. And it's really only been within the last 50 years or so that there's been a lot, a lot more writing for bands um, specifically. But this is kind of neat because for over, you know, over 100 years now, this festival has been generating a steady stream of new music written specifically for bands to play. And you know, by this point, there are hundreds and thousands of pieces of music that have been written for this festival that are now available to bands in Spain. And one of the things that I'm trying to do through my own studies and uh, conducting some area bands and some of the pres presentations that I'm planning to do and writing uh, that I'm planning to do is to try to introduce more of this music to American band directors and let them hear some of the great music that's available and how you can get it and how you can tie it into discussions in your class on Spanish culture and, and so forth. So, um, you know, it's a very special thing for me. Um, to have been able to go there. Um, the cities themselves often host or put on composition contests in order to bring about more writing. In the city of Alcoy, they've had a composition contest going on nonstop since 1949 with at least one winner each year and sometimes multiple winners depending on the quality of the, the music. And you have to figure that for that, every one that's picked, there's probably another 25 that weren't picked. And so there's all this music, and that's just Alcoy. The same thing happens in Ontinent and in other communities around Spain. Um, so it really has produced a lot of great music. So um, that's all that I've got to share with you today. Um, I actually do have two other presentations that I will be working on. One that digs a little deeper into the history of the music and, and how it works. And then one actually more for band directors about here's how you use this in your classroom. Um, you know, that eventually I will have ready to uh, share with people, but not just yet. Um, but, uh, you know, before you leave, if you'd like, I've got some things out here on the table. If you want to take a look at them, uh, starting at that end, or just some CDs. I came home with a stack of CDs like this that they just get, oh, you're interested in the music? Here, take this. Um, lots of free stuff that they gave me there. So feel free, you can take a look at those. And um, uh, these, here, these are publications that are printed in Alcoy each day. So like this one was printed the day of the musicians and it has information on all of the bands that came that day. This one has stuff on all the comparses. This is from the day of the Entradas, um, you know, other stuff. This right here, this is called the Rebista. This is their festival program. They print this every year. It's full of pictures, it talks about all the comparses, talks about important people, talks about the music that's involved, the dance groups that are involved. Um, there are articles in here, there's lots of uh, 
advertising in here as well. In fact, I think the first 50 pages are ads, but um, you got to pay for it somehow, right? Um, but there, you know, every year they ask people to write articles of historical perspective, musical perspective, artistic perspective that relate to this festival. Uh, in fact, actually, I wrote an article for the Revista in Cosentino, which will be published in their program this year, because um, I met the last day I was in Spain. I met the president of their festival and he found out what I was doing in Spain learning about it. and he said well hey would you write an article about your experience coming here and learning about the festival I said well sure I will so um, so feel free to take a look at whatever you'd like and thank you all for coming yeah no guitars no not in this festival there's a lot of guitar music in spain but not in this festival what is it that makes that keeps that festival going for 400 years you know i think it's just the passion that everyone has for it um you know and i i got to see it up close in in ways that a lot of people don't um you know i i was interviewing band directors and composers and musicians while i was there and to hear them talk about their festival you know, it's something that's so dear to them. And then even people who aren't musicians, the, the last night I was in Spain, uh, the last, well, the last full day I was in Spain, I stayed in someone's house in Ontonyent. And the, the man and woman that owned this house, I was using Airbnb, which is fantastic, by the way. Um, but they, you know, they sat down and had dinner with me and they knew just as much about this festival as any of the musicians that I talked to. In fact, the, the husband gave me like three CDs out of his own collection that he thought were important for me to have. Um, and he is also a member of a comparsa and so he had, he had photo albums that they wanted to show me and, and all of that. So, you know, it's just, you know, it's one of those things that they've really embraced and it's, it's just a central part of who they are. It's, it's really part of their identity as a community uh, with this festival. So are, you, are they getting a lot of high school and younger kids involved in playing instruments too? Yes, yeah. Now, it, music, music education in Spain and in much of Europe is different than here. They do not have music in their schools at all. If you want to learn to play an instrument, you go to school all day long and then in the afternoon or the evening, you go to the local music society and you take lessons and you play in bands. And um, you know, many of these communities have huge facilities, um, like three or four level floor buildings um, with rehearsal facilities and classrooms where they teach theory classes and um, teach lessons. And they have a, some of them have really, I mean, they have better performing and rehearsal facilities than we have and any building in the, I mean, better than the high schools. Um, so they, they put a lot of money into that. They, their bands are very, very important to them in, in Spain. In fact, in, in the, in the uh, region of Valencia, they have the highest concentration of community bands anywhere in the world. There are, there are approximately 1,000 community bands in the country of Spain over 600 of them are in the Valencia region. And some of them are absolutely fantastic. They will rival any collegiate wind ensemble anywhere in this country, some of them. Um, some of them are just amazing groups. So are they auditioning here to these bands? Yes, yeah. It, it, some of the best ones have like four or five bands, starting with a youth band, and then you know a more advanced band, and, and then you finally get up to the the big monster group. But like uh, while I was there, I went to see a concert in Cullera, um, and they have the town of Cullera has two fantastic community bands and and music societies, and each one of those bands is about 150 members, and that's just their advanced band. So they have you know six, seven hundred people involved with the bands, and then other people who just join the society. They're not even musicians. It's it's a social thing for them. A lot of those places, the first floor of their building is a bar, and restaurant, you know. So it's a very social thing for them. Yeah. I'm just curious. This is so traditional. Um, you know, what about the the Muslims and the 
North Africans that, that are that are still there? Well, there are a lot of them that are still there. I mean, it, much like here in the United States, you know, in Spain, chances are you have Muslim, you know, ancestors, you know, regardless of what family you're in. Um, it's, I mean, it's mixed in into it. But, you know, again, they've, the, the festival isn't about putting down one religion over another. I mean, yes, there's a religious side of it reflecting, you know, the fact that Spain itself is largely a Catholic country, but it, they really do kind of embrace, you know, a lot of different ideas there. They're a very open people, the, in my experience. Do the new people fit in to the... I think so. You know, I mean, as well as they do anywhere else, I, I imagine. I mean, uh, certainly there are issues that come with that that's going to be the case anywhere but you know I in in my experiences there and I've I've been to Spain four times now and I have never heard the least inkling of issues with that usually the things that I hear people uh, you know gripe about are you know back when Franco was was in charge we didn't have this problem or you know actually one of the first composers that I met with um, I had lunch with him and his family, and his wife is a bit younger than he is. And so he started talking about, you know, we didn't have this problem when Franco was, and his wife is just like, yeah, but we had all this other stuff. <laughs> we had to deal with Franco. But, <laughs> you know, I, you hear more from that era than, you know, than almost anything else right now. Now, of course, of course, right now we're also hearing about all the stuff that's happening up in Barcelona and, and the Catalan region. Um, you know, which we heard about, you know, this past winter and spring. Um, there's a lot of that kind of discussion going around. Can you give us a quick definition of a doble? Well, a paso doble is, um, it's a quick, well, a relatively quick double, ti uh, double time march or a double feel march. Uh, it's used for well, all sorts of Spanish festivities. Um, there are pasodobles that are written for festivals. There are pasodobles written specifically for the bullfighting arenas, uh, for regal events, royal events. I mean, it's it's a really it's a really prolific kind of genre in in that country. Um, in fact, at basically any band festival that you go to or band contest that you go to in Spain they are required to play a Paso Doble for their performance. So. Because I think we hear it for dance, for example. Like oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, it's, it's I mean, there's, there's some dance that can go along with it, but it's actually, it's meant to be more marching and festive music, not so much connected with dance. And, you know, our experience with, is with Paso Dobles here in the United States tend to be pretty limited, even in band circles. You know, if I talk to your average room full of band directors and I say Paso Doble, really only one piece will come to their mind. It's called Emperita Roca. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice Paso Doble, but there are thousands more that are as good or better um, that people just don't know about. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you again for coming. Thank you. Help yourself to cookies. And <laughs>